Well, it's good to be here, and thank the Lord for you, and your pastor heard me somewhere and uh, wanted me to come. I know Brother Frank Shoemate, who preached here last night. He and I were friends 37 years ago. We were out working the same bus route 37 years ago. And uh, we have been friends through the years. I was seven and a half years assistant pastor to Bobby Robertson at Gospel Light Baptist Church. I became his assistant pastor when I was 19 years old. I was his first assistant pastor. He was running 850 with no buses and had never had an assistant pastor. He had never had a secretary. He had never had uh, anybody to answer a telephone call or type a letter and was running 850 with no buses. He hired me to be all of the above. And he made a terrible mistake. But anyway, I was with him for seven and a half years and went straight from there to Iowa and started a church 35 years ago. And uh, has been there ever since in the cornfields of Iowa. And uh, that's my history. Uh, I married when I was there at Gospel Light. Married a girl out of that church. And we've been married 36 years now. And so that's my history. I've got a very brief history. I don't I haven't made many moves. I've had one church where I was assistant pastor, one church where I was pastor. I've got one wife, and uh, I've got seven children. Uh, we went seven and a half years wanting children and couldn't have any, we thought. And I made the mistake of having Dr. Jack Hiles pray for us. And I, I forgot to tell him how many, and we ended up with seven. And that was a terrible mistake. I called him. I said, look, you've got a lot of members of your church. Go pick on somebody else. I, I, we've got seven. He said, we'll have to pray for you and reverse that. I said, well, do it. Do it. I mean, anything. To give us relief down here. And we were almost like the couple who went to see their pastor. And they could not have children. And they said, Pastor, would you pray for us to have children? He said, yes, I will. They said, would you anoint us with oil and pray for us? He said, I will. So he opened his desk drawer to get his little bottle of sweet oil he kept there, and it was gone. One of the children had been in the office and moved it. He couldn't find it. He was embarrassed, so he buzzed his secretary. And he said, Maud, he said, look. He said, uh, I need some oil. She said, some what? He said, some oil. She said, what kind of oil? He said, don't matter what kind. I need some oil. Got to anoint this couple with oil. She said, I don't have any. He said, look, Maud. Go to the kitchen, get Wesson oil, cooking oil. Go to the furnace room, get motor oil. I don't go out there and get some oil out of a car. So I don't care what kind of oil you get. I got to have some oil. Well, then a little bit, she come roaring in there, rather afraid looking. And she had a little can of three-in-one oil. Now, don't get ahead of me. Uh, three-in-one oil. And he took a little of that three-in-one oil and put it on the man's forehead right there. Got a little more and put it on his finger and put it on the lady's forehead right there and knelt promptly and asked God to bless them with a little one. And I'm telling you, ten and a half months later, she gave birth to, guess what? Triplets after being anointed with three and one oil. He was afraid to go see her, afraid she'd have a bad attitude after him anointing her with three and one oil. But finally he went and took a larger than normal flower from the church. And as he walked in, she just broke out in one of them old-fashioned Baptocostal, hallelujah, praise God, spelled. I mean, tears of joy and laughing and shouting. He said, well, sister, I'm so glad to see you got a good attitude about this thing. After getting anointed with three and one all and having triplets, she said, oh, glory to God, preacher. I'm not rejoicing about that. I'm just thanking God you didn't anoint me with 10W40, that's all. We got accused of being anointed with 10W40. Uh, did I tell you to turn to Acts chapter number 20? Sometimes you forget what you said, and sometimes you don't know what you said. Yeah, sometimes you don't, and, and sometimes you don't, you're reading one thing, you think you're reading something else. An old country preacher, uh, he was uh, reading his text, um, and he was just about to kick off into one of them old-fashioned, and I love that. Oh, I love those wind suckers. And, uh, and, and he was just about to kick off and do some preaching, and uh, he was reading his text. And here's what he read in the book of Genesis. And he made her to be, and he turned the page. Well, he thought he turned the page. He, they were stuck together. He turned three at one time. Didn't even realize. Here's what he read. And he made her to be 152 cubits long, 100 cubits wide, 75 cubits tall, and he put a window in the top thereof. He stared at it for a moment. He said, she's a big one, she, huh? 
stared at it a little while longer. He said, folks, I wouldn't believe that myself. It wasn't in the Bible. I promise I wouldn't. And uh, so sometimes we read things that we, we don't even realize is there. Uh, Raymond Barber, pastors in Texas, he was going through the book of Daniel verse by verse. And one night he got up. He'd been in Daniel for weeks. He said, you know, why do we say things? What, you ever say something? Say, There's no rhyme or reason why I said that. He got up. He was ready to start his uh, Bible study on a Wednesday night. He got up and said, everybody turn to Jack Daniels chapter number 7, please. He said, what really bothered me? I looked up and had four deacons trying to find it. So that really did bother me. But uh, anyway, Acts chapter 20. Fellas, I'm sorry. I still don't hear these. Uh, maybe I set them out here. Would that help? No, they're nailed down. I can't. They got them wired down. I can't even move them. Well, I'll turn them this way a little bit. That'll help. Just if you can create anything you can do to those monitor speakers. I... Okay. All right. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, Acts chapter number 20. I, I, I've asked the preacher about at least three or four sermons. I said, have you ever heard? And I'd call the name of sermon. He said, no, I've never heard that. I said, have you ever heard this? He said, no, I've never heard that. Um, and uh, I asked him about another. He said, I've never heard that. I've been preaching for 43 years. I've been preaching since I was 18 years old. I've been pastoring the same church for 35 years. I've never been here before. In addition to all that, I've been going up and down the country about every week preaching in somebody's church. So you can imagine how many things I would like to preach tonight, this being my first time in this church. But here's a message right here that um, uh, I'm going to preach from Acts chapter number 20. Now, I could preach a lot of messages I would love to preach tonight, but I do not know of any message that could be preventative medicine for the destruction of this church more than what I'm about to preach. If you, I'm not a good preacher, and I don't claim this is a great sermon at all, but if you will listen to this message, you're going to find out that you, you're going to hear something. Oh, there's my monitor speakers. That's what I've been waiting for. Whoa, you found the right button, didn't you? Good. And, and we need to turn them down a little bit, do we? I can turn them down right here. I'll turn them down. There we go. Thank you. I got two fellas up there, and they're pointing every which way and doing all kinds of things. Thank you. Thank you. Boy, I'm in the program now. I'll tell you what. My nose is about to light up right now. All right. Acts chapter number 20. Everybody stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. It's preaching time. Acts 20 and verse number 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. This is the apostle Paul speaking. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, there's one. If pastor was talking about a while ago, God shed his blood. There it is right there. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Whose blood was that shed on Calvary's cross? God's blood. You see it? Feed the church of who? God. Which he, meaning God, hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this. By the way, I'm going to take a drink of water. I'm so dry I'd have to be primed to spit. That's good. They said they'd run out of water and they went and got this somewhere. I'm just checking to make sure it wasn't a snuff dipper here had a hold of that cup there. All right, here we go. He said, to Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Grievous wolves. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. The word perverse means different than things. To draw away disciples after them. Therefore... Watch, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He said this. He said the wolves are coming. He said, I know this. He didn't say, I think this. I'm afraid of this. It very well could happen. He said, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He said grievous wolves. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. 
um, he said, in your congregation, men are going to arise speaking perverse, meaning different than what you've heard things, to draw away followers or disciples after them. Therefore, watch. And remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. We apply that verse to soul winning, and we can apply that verse to soul winning, but we can never interpret that verse to mean soul winning. Paul wasn't referring here to warning every man night and day crying with tears over getting saved. Now, he did that, but that's not what this verse is talking about. This is verse that says, for three years, I warned you the wolves are coming. The wolves are coming. I was warning church members. I was warning saved people. The wolves are coming. I want to bring you a message tonight entitled, Blowing the Whistle on the Wolf. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you for meeting with us. What a wonderful thing to be in God's house, to be where the Lord's people are. And dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for these preachers here tonight. And I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for these, your children here tonight. I pray, Lord Jesus, you'll do something in this service that will never be undone as long as the world stands. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll protect this ministry through this message. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. Wolves are dangerous. Wolves are to be avoided. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note, watch me now, note that man and have no company with him. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine ye have received and avoid them. Wolves are dangerous. Now, Brother Pastor, I want to ask you a question in front of this crowd. <clears throat> Have you ever in your lifetime, this first time in this church, have you ever in your lifetime ever shared with me any potential problem or problem as far as discord you've ever had in this church? Have you ever done that? Have you ever in your lifetime t told me about anybody or said even that you had anybody that was a problem or that you ever suspected might be a problem in this church as far as discord or division? Is there anybody else? And by the way, do you think this preacher and I would agree to lie to you publicly from this platform? You, don't, you know that's not true. All right, now let me ask this question. Do, is there anybody else in here? Layman, preacher, member, visitor. Is there anybody else in here that you, you have told me about anybody in this church that is a problem or a potential problem or gossips or is a seed of division in any way? If so, raise your hand. I want to see who you are. If, you, if you've told me anything or you, you know of anybody that's told me anything. Okay, so there is nobody. Now, the reason I say that is this. Before I get done tonight, you're going to vow somebody told me something. Before I get done tonight, you are going to vow somebody loaded my wagon. Before I get done tonight, I'm going to plow up somebody's tater patch, and you're going to think I'm going to call their name before I get done. And I don't have a clue who I'm going to be preaching about. I've seen the most unusual things happen when I preach this sermon I've ever seen in my life. And so you buckle your seatbelt because we're going to try to mark wolves tonight. A wolf will never tear your church up if you know what one is when you see them. If you understand what a wolf is and how they act and how they behave, you, it will, this message will not stop wolves from coming in your church. It will not run wolves out of your church. But what it will do, it will mark them. And if we can get them marked, they will never tear your church up. A wolf does his stuff unsuspectingly. He, you don't know what a wolf is. And when you don't know what a wolf is... They will tear your church all to pieces. This church will never fall because of the devil out there fighting against your church. It will never fall. But when churches go down, they go down because they go down from the inside. Churches fall from the inside. A house divided against itself cannot stand. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to mark wolves. Now, somebody has said there are three kinds of wolves. The evening wolves in Zephaniah 3.3. 3. 
the ravening wolves in Matthew 7, 15, and the grievous wolves here in our text in Acts 20, 29. The evening wolves are the subtle wolves, the sneaky wolves, and they're all that way. I was preaching in a church in your state, not too awful far from here. I could drive there, I guess, an hour and a half or so. In your state, a church running 800 or so. And uh, I was preaching there. And, uh, and so I, I, I said to the pastor, uh, do you have any wolf troubles? I never asked that. I never asked that. Uh, I don't want, if this man had started to tell me, he said, well, you pray, we got a little trouble. So hold it. I don't want to hear it. Because I want to be free when I preach. And I want you to know I'm not cranking you. I'm just preaching the word. And so I said to him, uh, do you have any wolf troubles? And he said, nope, not a one. Man, we are doing fine. I, he said, why do you ask? I said, I feel led to preach the wolf sermon tonight. He said, preach it. You never know. Uh, when a little preventative medicine, I said, you're right about that. So I preached it. Little did he know that his secretary and her husband, who was a deacon, had already started making the rounds on him. Little did he know that his secretary was revealing information that was confidential and that she and her deacon husband was already sowing innuendos about the pastor and drawing suspicion and question marks about his decisions, that not about his character necessarily, but about his decisions in the church to... Uh, and, and decisions that he makes. Little did he know. And when I got to preaching, I so identified them and marked them, people were turning around looking at them while I was preaching. It got bad. It got real bad. Nobody knew it. Preacher didn't know it. I didn't know it. And within a week and a half, they, tip, they mounted their horse, tipped their hat, and rode off into the sunset. He called me and said, oh, Brother Brown, you saved my ministry. I said, Brother, I didn't save your ministry. The Holy Ghost of God saved your ministry. That's who saved your ministry. And so there's the evening wolves. Then there's the ravening wolves. I had a pastor uh, running a 1,000 in a certain state call me, and he said, Brother Brown, he said, uh, I got a youth director. And the youth director has the hearts of the people because he has their children. And he said, he started talking against me very subtly. What should I do? I said, you make a beeline straight to him, look him in the eye, tell him you know what he's doing. And the next time he opens his mouth about you, you're going to go straight to the pulpit and give the people the opportunity to pick him or you to pastor that church and bring it to a vote. I said, if you do that, you'll lose that many people, right? That many families. You'll he was running a 1,000. I said, you'll, you'll lose that many families right there. I said, if you don't, you'll have to lose your whole ministry. He didn't. He didn't. He let it go. He let him go. Last I knew, that church running a 1,000 was running 200 in the shadow of the church it was. Not even the same style of church it was. Ravening wolves. Ravening wolves. Wolves that tear up churches and then grievous wolves. Wolves that cause grief. Oh, I could write a book. I could write a book. I mean, a certain pastor called me. He said, my wife's down in the bed. She's about to have a nervous breakdown. They knifed her in the back and knifed me in the back until she came. I had a man come to see my wife and I one night drove to my home. And he said, can we come in? I said, yes. I looked, took one look at that woman. I knew she had to have help. He said, I came in today. He said, the wolves have so knifed me in the back through her. They hadn't got enough guts to come to me, so they'll come to her. And he said, I came in today. She put a twenty-two rifle to her head and tried to kill herself. And he said, what am I going to do? I said, get out. Get out. Run. I won't bury my wife over anybody's church. If I lose my church, I might get another one. If I lose my wife, I'm done, friend. I'm not burying my church over anybody. I'm not burying my wife over anybody's church. And you're not listening to a church hopper tonight. I've spent 34 years in one church to prove you don't move on every time there's a little trouble. But I will not bury my wife over anybody's church. And he left, and he went to another church. He'd been there 18 years and won hundreds of people to God. And you got a good man here. I guess you know that. You got a good man here. And if time comes you don't want him, just give me a ring. I'll take him off your hands. I got a dozen churches waiting right now for him. But I'm going to tell you something. If you can't stand behind him and you can't say amen and you can't back the man of God, you kept, you mount your horse and you ride off into the sunset somewhere. Amen. Amen. I'm talking about grievous wolves. 
good. Somebody has said the bees and the birds and the cows all low and hum and sing in the, in the major chord. But he said the wolves always howl in the minor chord. I believe I hear a wolf howling now. I believe I hear a wolf howling now somewhere. Maybe I was wrong. Oh, I'm right. I'm right. I do hear a wolf howling. A little bit louder. Crank it up, boys. Let me tell you something, folks. You're not listening to dogs howling tonight. You're actually listening to the voices of wolves. Not in a zoo, but in the wild. In upper Canada and Alaska by a man who spent his lifetime following wolves and recording at night their voices. And only a godly pastor in his spirit knows the interpretation of that discord you hear tonight. And you know what we're going to do tonight? By the grace of God, we're going to blow the whistle on the wolf. That's exactly what we're going to do. Thank you, men. God bless you. Number one, wolves have carnal appetites. Wolves have carnal appetites. If you don't want to draw up a bunch of wolves, in, uh, in uh, just don't dump a bunch of, don't gut a cow in wolf country. That's all. Don't put out a bunch of flesh. Keep the place clean. Keep the house of God clean. Amen and amen and amen. Keep it clean. I mean, keep the old drums off the platform. Keep the contemporary Christian rock music out of the house of God. I mean, keep Sister Wigglejaw off the platform, waddling up here with a dress on so disgraceful we can't discuss it publicly here tonight. Waddled up here with a dress on four sizes, too small, so much green eye shadow on, looks like her gallbladder's busted. Waddle up here and grab a microphone. Began to caress it and sing in that breathy voice. Do you know Jesus? God have mercy. We got saved out of that kind of stuff. If we wanted that kind of junk, we'd go to the nightclub and get it. But he had put a new song in our hearts, even praise unto our God. And friend, I want to tell you, keep the junk out of the house of God. This Amy Grunt, Fatty Patty, Heave Green, Andrea Grouch junk, it ain't put no ham on the hog, boys. It's like the curl on the pig's tail. Looks cute, but it don't put no ham on the hog. Amen, this contemporary background junk. God have mercy. God have mercy. Keep the place clean. Number two, wolves love layups. You say, what do you mean? Well, they travel at night, and when the sun gets hot, they'll lay down. And all of them want to get up on a ledge overlooking everybody else. They're like the Pharisees in Luke eleven forty three 43 that love the uppermost seats. Uh, they, they, don't, they, don't, they want a position. They want to serve on somebody's board or committee. They don't want a bus route. They don't want to show up on soul winning visitation. They don't want to grab a mop and, vom- and clean up vomit between Sunday school and preaching where some little child threw up. They don't want to clean a toilet. They don't want to change a baby's diaper in the nursery. What they want to do is get up and shine. That's what, they, I, I mean, listen, uh, they want to, uh, and another thing, you, you can't get them in church on Sunday morning. They'll be out in hallways and out somewhere instead of in the house of God. Look, get in the house of God. Hear the word of God. They want to establish a new criteria for spirituality other than soul winning. Uh, Oh, yeah. You put your preacher, you put your humble, tithing, praying, godly, sacrificing, soul winning people in charge of things, and you will live a happy life. They love fellowships over at their house. Well, we have a little group that meets at my house. Yeah, a fellowship, my hind leg. It's gossip ship. That's what it is, and you know it. Well, God called me to meet the needs of people. No, he didn't. He called your pastor to meet their needs. He called you to be a servant and to pray and to go soul winning and to, and to show up for church and to live right. That's what he called you to do. And so uh, I'm just saying unruly and vain talkers, deceivers whose mouths must be stop, stopped, subverting whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. Jude one sixteen, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. I'm just talking about they want a position instead of a condition. Wolves love layups. They want to be over people. Brother, and, and, and a pastor, I want you to know, in the last five churches I've been in, God has used me to sing. Well, thanks for the warning, Gertrude. We don't want to hear anybody sing it push their way up here. We don't want to hear anybody sing it thanks they're so good. We'd rather hear somebody sing it 
is humble and loves the Lord and somebody that that was asked to be up here and feels unworthy to be up here. Hey, they're looking for a position. We ought to be looking for a condition tonight. We ought to be on the altar asking God to make us pure and right and clean and holy instead of wanting to shine all the time. Say amen right there. Here's another thing about wolves. Uh, uh, they want to, All wolves want to be leaders of the pack. All wolves want to be leaders of the pack. 3 John 9 and 10, I wrote into the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth. He said he loves to have the preeminence among them. I, I mean, you watch people that love to have people polarizing around them. Watch them in the vestibule. Watch them at those. I didn't write in your load of pumpkins this afternoon. I know a few things. And what I know, I know real well. And I want to tell you something the Bible says. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. And here in, in verse um, uh, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you, for the, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Verse 24, Salute all them that have the rule over you. They don't like those scriptures. Uh, they're too much like that crowd number 16, Korah and that crowd, that said to Moses, you take too much upon yourself. Uh, you, all the congregation's holy, and you act like you're holier than everybody else. No, the reason they said that, they wanted to shine. They wanted to rule. They, they, were, they were trying to usurp authority against God's man. And I'm going to tell you what else they'll do. They'll say, <laughs> Pastor, here's what they'll do. They'll make an appointment with you, and they'll come to see you. And when they come to see you, they'll sit down and they'll say, Now, Pastor, I want to thank you for allowing me to have an appointment with you. But, Pastor, are you ready for this? If you forget everything that I say tonight, don't forget the next phrase. Pastor, people are coming to me. That's it. That's it right there. People are coming to me. Now, Brother Pastor, when you hear that, you got a wolf. I'm going to tell you how I know you do in a minute. Listen to me. You got a wolf, and you know you got a wolf. And I'm going to tell you why he knows he's got a wolf. Because you've got people in this, I don't know who they are, but you got some people in this church that a wolf or somebody with a critical spirit would never go to. You got some of them. They're good people. Let me say that again. You got some members of this church that a person with a critical spirit wanted to criticize you, criticize this church, criticize the program of this church. You got some people in this congregation that a critic would never go to and criticize you to. They know better. They know better. They know their own kind. They know who will listen to it, and they know who won't listen to it. And when a person comes to you, and they say, people are coming to me, you got a wolf, because they wouldn't be coming to that person if they wasn't a wolf. Now, by the way, what I'm going to preach tonight is not just for you. It's for him. He needs to be educated about some things, and he's already pretty smart. But I'm going to tell you something. He's going to hear some things tonight to help him. I want you to tune in, and you're going to hear a whole lot of things to help you before I'm done tonight. But I want you to listen carefully. People are coming to me. Now, if you've got any question at all about whether they're a wolf or not, ask them this question. Who are they? By the way, never worry about who they are that's coming to them. Usually it's just the guy's wife. That's all. Or if it's a woman, it's her little puny husband. It's a hen pecked. He has to roost on a bedpost of a night. That's all. That's all. So don't worry about who's coming to it. But anyway, it, they, oh, but here's what they'll say. Oh, pastor, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't divulge that information. I would hurt good people. These people have come to me in confidence. These people have come to me, and they have confided in me, and I, I couldn't hurt them. I would betray confidence, pastor, if I were to divulge their names. Now, stay with me. Listen carefully. You see, you don't really get what's happening here, but I'm going to explain it to you. This person now 
is saying to this man in so many subtle ways, these people didn't come to you, Pastor. These people came to me. So these people thought more of me than you. These people confided in me rather than the pastor. And pastor, I am pastoring these people. I have, I have um, divorced these people from your leadership. They are not coming to you. They're coming to me. And furthermore, I wouldn't even tell you who these people are that are coming to me. Pastor, you got a wolf. You got a first-class wolf. When you hear that little phrase, people are coming to me. Now, if I were some of you, I would smile and do this right now. Because the look on some of your faces is, number one, making me suspicious. And number two, it is motivating me greatly. I mean, let me tell you something, Hazel. I've been preaching this way for 43 years. I can't quit tonight just because you look like you're soaking a prune for tomorrow's lunch. I've preached to a whole lot. Listen, you look, I may not weigh but 140 pounds soaking wet and full of bananas, but I'm going to tell you something, friend. You got one little old bald-headed preacher up here you can't do nothing with tonight. Did you get that? Amen. And I want to tell you something. When you give me the sour look, it's just like saying, sick them to a bulldog to me, friend. You can buckle your seatbelt. If you don't like my preaching, the best thing you can do is act like you do. It will be easier on you if you act like you do, even if you don't. Amen. And I mean, people are coming to me. Hey, here's another, here's another thing that we found out about this wolf. In studying wolves, you're going to love this one. This is, I love this best of all. In studying wolves, they, they, they watch these wolves at night with these infrared lights, you know, and these, these uh, high-tech cameras. And they, they, these wolves trot in a line. be a whole group of these wolves. And they trot in a line. Up front will be a big old dog wolf, big old timber wolf, way up in Canada and Alaska. They can uh, top out about 120 pounds. Right behind him is a little old 60 to 70-pound female, just about half his size. And she's trotting along behind him. And you'll say, how cute. Look at her following the leader. And as they go through the woods, watch me now, as they go through the woods, trotting through the woods, they'll come to a fork. So kind of a, a trail will go off this way. And you, you men that have deer hunted, you know what a deer trail looks like. Well, you women, you wouldn't see a blooming thing out there. Not a blooming thing. But, but you men, you know what I'm talking about. You, you see this deer trail, it'll, it'll go off to the right. Well, anyway, they'll be trotting along like this, trotting along, and he's doing the funniest thing. This wolf is dropping his head to the right and left constantly. They didn't understand why they did that for years. Now they've got it. They got it figured out. Here's what's happening. He, he's up front. She's right behind him. He's cutting his head to the right and to the left. He's watching her out of his peripheral vision. Now, when they come to a fork, the strangest thing commonly happens. She'll decide she wants to go this direction. So what she'll do, she'll start down this trail. When she does that, he catches her out of his peripheral vision. He just jumps over in front of her. And he goes down that trail in front of her. In a little bit, they'll come to another fork. She'll decide she wants to go this direction. So when she breaks to go this direction, he just jumps over in front of her. And they found out something. It looks like it's that big dog wolf leading the pack, but it's not. It's that little old female. That's what it is, that little old female. She's really the one calling the shots. Oh, yes. I done told you something now, Boudreaux. You better listen to me. Every pastor here knows what I'm... Let me tell you something. I pastored the same church 35 years, and I've learned something. About nine times out of every eight, when you got a man rising up, there's a little female behind it somewhere, 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 somewhere. I'm just saying here, uh, oh, yeah, and let me tell you what the problem is. God made every man in this room to be a king and rule somewhere. And if a man's married and he loves his wife and he has her under his arm in care and love, and that woman is submitted to her husband, and he loves her and she loves him, and he's the leader of the home. He says, honey, this is the way God's telling us, go, let's go. And she says, she loves to have it so. She has confidence in him. And they're a mighty team together. That man is a fulfilled man. He is in his kingdom. 
He has his world in control. He's as happy as a coon in the cornfield with a hound dog tied. And she's as tickled as she can be to be married to such a man. And they are one royal team. And that man is so fulfilled, he's ruling in his little kingdom. And he don't have any need to come down here and try to tear up your kingdom. You don't run his kingdom. You don't go down there and mess with his home. You don't go in there and tell him how to run his house. He don't come up here and tell you how to run your church. When he comes into this church, he's sitting there with his lovely wife. He is thrilled to death to let you pastor this church. This is your domain. This is your rule. And he is glad to have you do it because he is a fulfilled man and he don't need to give you any competition because he is ruling and he is a fulfilled man. But nine cases out of every eight, whenever you get a man that stands up and wants to constantly give you trouble in the church, he is not in control of his home. There's something wrong. And I don't care how meek and sweet and humble that little thing sounds on prayer meeting night when she stands up and says, I just want to thank God I have a real man that's the head of our home. Oh, Let me tell you something, friend. All that shines is not gold in a Baptist church. And I know a few things. I mean, 43 years, week after week, I've sat in Shoney's out here and talked to pastors across America for 40 years. I know a few things. There's a woman behind it. And the man has trouble in his home. Things are not adjusted right, or he wouldn't be giving you trouble. I'm talking, hey, hey, I, I, I believe I hear another wolf howling. I really do. Oh, I think we got one tree tonight, don't you, huh? And you know what we're doing? We're blowing a whistle on the wolf. Oh, yeah. And here's another thing. Thank you, fellas. Here's another thing about wolves we found out. A wolf won't let the pastor pastor the church. He won't leave him alone so he can pastor the church. You say, what are you talking about? Well, I've had several assistant pastors that have gone out and pastored. I had one I took in right out of Bible college. He was with, with me 10 years. He took a little church. He's now averaging 600 in a great, great church. And he was back preaching for me. And one uh, Sunday night or Wednesday night when he was, and we, we preached for each other. I have a wonderful relationship with all the men that have ever been my assistants. I'm just sick and tired of training men to go somewhere else. I'd like to train one to stay with me now and then. But anyway... Uh, he came back, he was preaching for me, and here's what he said when he was preaching to my people. He said, I'm so glad I've got a church that will allow me to lead the church. And the people kind of looked at him, my people did. He said, let me explain what I mean. He said, I got up on a Wednesday night, not long, or a Sunday night, not long ago. He said, folks, what I'm about to do is going to be a little irregular. But he said, I'd like to mention tonight that we drop immediately, effective immediately, uh, missionary so-and-so and not support him anymore. Man was home on furlough, I think, at that time. And people were shocked because it was a very emulated missionary, one especially the young people really thought a lot of it, and the parents too. And he said, I would like to drop his support immediately, and I would like to do it without discussion if the church would let me. People did almost quit breathing. A deacon raised his hand back and said, Pastor, if I'm understanding you correctly, you feel, based on knowledge you have, it would be very wise for us to vote tonight to drop this missionary support, even though we've supported him for years, and to do it without knowing why and without any discussion at all and without you telling us why. Is that what I'm hearing? He said, yes, sir, that's exactly what you're hearing. He said, I make a motion, we do it. Another second said, I, uh, deacon said, I second it. And the people voted unanimous. And here's what he said to my congregation. He said, I'm so glad. They didn't force me to get up and tell that congregation that that missionary had been messing with his own little girls. He said, I'm so glad they didn't force me to tear down the image of missions and missionaries and cause questions of doubt in the minds of young people about godly men. Let the pastor pastor the church. Little fit, true story. Little 15-year-old girl got expecting in the church. Parents in the church. I'm not talking about a bus kid. I'm talking about a prominent family in the church. Not my church, but another church. 
And the mom and daddy came broken hearted. Preacher, what are we going to do? We're afraid she's going to murder the little baby. What are we going to do? He said, I don't know. The pastor was broken hearted, but he said, look, we'll do what we can. We're going to try to help the little thing. She's as confused as a termite and a yo-yo, you know, a little thing running around 15 year old with more body than she had brain to know how to take care of and she had brain bouncing around like a pea in a box car and <clears throat> and so he was going to try to get to her and help her but before he could get to her here came Miss Wigglejaw. Pastor, have you heard? He said, yes, ma'am, I've heard. I mean, have you heard about little so-and-so being expected? Yes, ma'am, I've heard. Pastor, what are we going to do about it? He said, well, uh, we, we're tr I'm trying now to do something about it. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm getting an appointment with her. I want to sit down and talk to her. I'm trying to. She said, no, I don't mean that. When are we going to church her? When are we going to church her? When are we going to vote her out? He said, well, ma'am, first thing we'd like to do, if possible, see her get right with God. The first thing we'd like to do is see if the little thing would turn to the Lord. We, we love her. We know she's done wrong, and we don't condone her sin, ma'am. But the first thing we'd like to do is see her get right with the Lord. Some old boy has deceived her, and, and we don't justify her at all. But, you know, if she could get right with God, and, and we could maybe find a home for this little baby, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if she got her? Pastor, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right. Little girl running around here to church, prominent family, great with child, us do nothing about it. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right. Boy, she started her round. I mean, she got her little groups after services. Boy, she was having a time. She was really having a time until somebody leaned over and informed her the father to the baby was her son. She shut her flap. Suddenly, she had a change of attitude. Suddenly, she didn't want a pastor to kick him out in the alley, stomp her guts out, and let him go into hell with the rest of them. Suddenly, she wanted a pastor that would reach down and reach out and, and love people and help people and lift people up. She wanted a pastor with compassion to try to save her son now, as well as this little old girl. Let the pastor pastor the church. True story. A pastor sat down with his youth director. And the youth director was giving two or three months of youth activities at one time. Baptist church. He said, now on this Sunday, uh, we're going to uh, ride horses with the young people. And on this Sunday, we'll go bowling. Uh, Saturday, I mean. And on the next Saturday, uh, uh, we're going to play softball. And on the next Saturday, we're going over to Brother So-and-So's house to swim. And, on the, and the pastor hold it. He said, uh, <clears throat> Brother, uh, wh why don't you, it uh, be a good idea to take them back bowling or horseback riding or uh, softball on that Saturday instead of swimming. And the little youth director, he is making notes, and he looked up and he said, um, uh, Pastor, uh, it, it's Brother So-and-So's house. You know, he sings in the choir. And uh, uh, he said, I know, but it'd be better if we did something else on that Saturday. By the way, learn to catch your pastor's eye. Don't force him to tell you everything. It'll hurt you, it'll hurt good people, and it'll hurt your church. And he said, yeah, I know. And, and the little youth director said, but pastor, uh, he, he's, the girls, uh, the boys are swimming up the, in the morning. And the girls are swimming in the afternoon. And, and there ain't going to be no boys over there at all when the girls are swimming. He said, I know that. I expected you to have those standards. But he said, I would still just, I feel like it would be better if we played ball. He, he said, pastor, look, there's an eight-foot privacy fence. Now, the little kid had gone too far already. He had gone too far already. He said, Pastor, there ain't going to be a, a boy within five miles of the place when the girls are there. He said, I know. He said, but it, the guy sings in the choir. He said, I know. He said, it's private. He said, I know. But I just feel like, and the youth director already had gone too far. And then he made the fatal mistake. Real confused about the matter, he shared that with his closest friend in the church. And a bird of the wind carried it. And his close friend shared it with somebody else. And finally, soon, a little bit of a buzz was going around the church. And here's what was being said. 
I'm for standards, and I'm for convictions. But I just personally think we're going a little too far when you can't have a bunch of boys in an eight-foot privacy fence to swim, and five hours later take the girls over there and let them swim. The guy's not going to even be there when the girls are there. We're guaranteed of that. We're just going a little too far in this standards thing around you. You see, what they didn't know was, even though the guy sang in the choir, he was a queer. And they didn't know what the pastor did. They didn't know that, he, that, that the guy had invited the swim party over there because he wanted to sit there and lust after those boys. They didn't know that he wanted to sit there and lust after them boys as young as 12 and 13 years old and that that pastor, that godly pastor, was trying to protect their sons against a pervert that would maybe m- molest or even murder them someday. And the pastor couldn't tell them because he couldn't prove it. He knew it, but he couldn't prove it. And he was getting his act together like a shrewd lawyer. You don't know how many hats this man has to wear. You don't know how many things this man has to deal with. Don't you ever, don't you ever go on a vacation and turn your Sunday school class over to somebody else. You let him handle it, or the superintendent, or somebody he's put in charge of it. You say, well, I'm just going to have Miss So-and-so teach my class. Miss So-and-so may be a wonderful lady, but there may be reasons she should not teach in this church. Let the pastor pastor the church, and that church split down the middle, and those people threw away a godly pastor and a godly church because they just would not let the pastor pastor of the church. Let me tell you something. You never went to a basketball game in your life where your precious little boy was playing. But what at some time during that game, that referee made one dumb call against your boy. Say amen right there. I mean, he made one silly, crazy, stupid call against your boy. And of course, you know it better than the ref did because after all, he was just right there three foot from the play and you were up in the top of the grandstand. Your pastor's a whole lot closer to problems in the church than you are. Whole lot closer. He sees things a whole lot clearer than you do. Let the pastor pastor the church. I'm going to tell you where you get in trouble. You stand up in the grandstands. You see a call that looks so stupid. Have you ever seen a call that looked dumb? And then you was, you was talking to a friend. You said, did you see that crazy call that rev made? They said, yeah, I saw it. But I was down here at this angle, and I saw the guy did hit him. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Things you look at aren't always as they appear to be. Let the pastor... Look, if you can trust him to pray down bread from heaven on Saturday night to keep you walking with God, to keep your marriage together, to keep your teenagers out of sin, to keep your little babies out of hell, in God's dear name, why can't you trust him to make some decisions about this church? Let the pastor pastor the church. I could preach a whole lot more popular sermons than I'm preaching tonight, but I didn't come here on a popularity contest. I came here to help this church. This is my first time here. And the way some of you are looking, it might be my last time here. But I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to prune some sassafras bushes while I'm here. Amen. Sure, I'm not for sale, friend. Wolves want to be leaders of the pack, and they won't let the pastor pastor of the church. I'll tell you what they'll do. Let the ref be the ref. You know what a wolf will do. You know what an old sow wolf will do that has three or four little wolf cubs, pups back in the den. She'll go and find some deer that's been dead just about 30 days. I mean, that thing is half decayed. There's maggots everywhere. And she'll ingest that. They eat anything. She'll ingest that. And if that isn't sickening enough, she'll go back to the den. She'll regurgitate that, and those little pups will sit there and eat them. Do you know what a wolf will do in the church? They'll go around and collect all the yarn. They'll go around and collect all the dirt and the filth and all, every negative thing in the world. And they'll go home, and they'll dump that out for their children and for their family and dump it out for their friends. And I'm going to tell you something. There's coming a time your child's going to need that man right there. 
And if you've torn down his image by stuff you said in your house, they ain't going to care one lick for him. And you're going to be in trouble when your child needs counsel and when they need help. You are going to be in trouble. A whole lot of trouble. Now, here's what I'm saying. Let the ref be. I believe I hear another wolf howling now. I think we got another wolf treat already, don't you? Oh, yeah. Crank it up higher if you got no more volume, men. Crank it up. I believe I hear a wolf howling. And you know what we're doing tonight? We're blowing a whistle on the wolf. Here's another one. Here's another one. Listen carefully. Wolves live dangerous lives. Wolves live dangerous lives. You say, what do you mean? Well, a lot of wolves get killed by shepherds. But a lot of wolves get killed another way, too. Acts 20 and 29, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. John 10, 7, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Uh, wolves, you, you, don't, you don't love life in long days. You lift up your hand against God's anointed. There's a man, if I called his name, every pastor in this room, at least 35 years of age and older, would know him. Built a church in this state of over 1,500. God, man. Preached, preached for me. Preached over America. And picture appeared constantly in the sword, sword of the Lord. He said, I had a man in my church that turned against me. Had as an adult teacher, adult Sunday school, school class. He turns against me. There were 23 people in that class. In 12 months, 21 one of the 23 were dead. 21 of the 23 were dead. They turned against him. I said, brother, now this is a man you know. If you preach, you want to know who it is. I'll, I'll give you his name after the service. I said, brother, what in the world? I said, how did they die? He said, preacher, they died so mysterious. Some of them died with cancer. Some of them died with heart attacks. Some of them died in car wrecks. Some of them died. Uh, they never did figure out why they died. He said, it was so mysterious that the church and community accused me of putting a hex on them. Really? Seriously? They accused me of doing something to these people. Let me tell you something. You live a dangerous life. You live a dangerous life when you lift up your hand against God. Let me tell you, that man right there, is as, he, he is as human as any man in this church. He has to get up of the morning and put his britches on just like everybody else in this church does, every man in this church. But I'm going to tell you something, and you listen to me carefully. Because of his position, because of who he is, you better keep your mouth off of him. You better keep your mouth off of him or you're going to have trouble in your family. I could tell a whole lot of stories that I dare not tell. I'll tell you a couple of three of them. I, oh, man, I'm thinking of a dozen real-life things that have come to me. I mean, real life. I have a fellow in Illinois. He was preaching one night on smoking. It wasn't too popular. And he said, your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, and you suck 19 different poisons down your esophagus every time you take a drag off of one of those uh, coffin nails. And while he was preaching, four pews from the back, a deacon stood up and pointed his finger and said, Preacher, I'll tell you something. And I want everybody here to know, I smoke. I've been smoking for years. If I saw anything wrong with it, I'd quit. I'm going to keep smoking. I just want you to know it. And I want the congregation to know it. And he sat down. And this pastor said, man, it just, he said, it, you could feel the satanic that just fell over the congregation. He said, I, I, I didn't get mad at him at all. But boy, it grieved my spirit grieved my soul and he said I went home and I couldn't sleep said the next morning early his wife the man's wife called him said listen I, uh, my husband wants you to come to the hospital he said what's he doing at the hospital said well he'll tell you when you get there he wants you to come to the hospital bring a tape recorder what for he said he'll tell you when you get there he went to the hospital and walked in the man had had an asthma attack <clears throat> he was laying in the bed and he said pastor I want to tell you by the way when I heard this story I got the man's name, got his telephone number, called him, and got him to tell me this story in person. I say in person, I mean over the telephone. Okay, now follow this carefully. He said, when I walked in the room, I had my tape recorder at his request. He said, he looked up at me and said, Pastor, listen, let's save all the gab. 
He said, last night, when I stood up and pointed my finger at you and rebuked you in that service, he said, when I sat down, God said to me, as clear as if he had spoken out loud, he said to me, you just signed your death warrant. And he said, Pastor, I'm going to be dead here in a few minutes. God showed me that. I said, Brother, what did you say to him? He said, I said to him, Brother, look, you're, you're not going to be dead because you've got a repentant attitude. and You didn't make me mad. I wasn't mad at you. I'll, I'll admit you totally dismantled me. But he said, I was grieved. But, brother, God bless you. God bless you for your spirit. You, you've gotten right about it. God bless He said, no, Pastor, listen. I lifted up my finger. I stood against you. The Spirit of God told me right then, I signed my death warrant. I'm going to be dead in a few minutes. Get your tape recorder on. They taped his testimony. Now, follow this. They, he talked, and he taped the testimony. He'd been a deacon for years in that church. At his funeral, they played that tape. His own grown son got saved. Other things happened in the service. Unbelievable. But here's what happened. After he recorded that testimony, uh, this brother said, I walked, as a Baptist preacher now. I'd heard him preach before I called him. He walked out of the room and started down the hall And after he recorded the testimony, and he saw the man's doctor coming up the hall. And he said, hey, doc, come here. I need to talk to you. And he said, look, he said, I just had a visit with this brother, and he says that he's going to be dead. He said, look, he told me that too. Now, you guys can believe that junk if you want to. He just had a little asthma attack. He's, he's even better. His oxygen level's going up. He's going to be better. And when he said that, the nurse came running out of the room. Doctor, doctor, please come quick, come quick. And the doctor and the pastor together went down and ran in the room. And when they got in the room, he's laying there going, oh, 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 and he's dead in five minutes. He said, what happened to him? He crossed the line. Preacher preaching down here at Virginia Beach, got to preaching on a, a fellow, a deacon in the church is selling liquor in his place of business. And this fellow got mad and told his family, get up, we're leaving, in the middle of the sermon, and hollered at the pastor, I'll be back when you're gone. And the godly pastor doing the preaching there said, Brother, you'll run into God on down the road too. That man had been a deacon in that church for years. When I, listen, I, by the way, you preachers want to know who this preacher was? I'll give his name after service. You know him, too. He's out of this state. That man went home that night, laid down in a rage, and his sweet wife, been married to him for years, got up and gently reached over, claims till this day she don't know what she's doing, reached over and pulled the drawer open, reached down, got a live 38, dropped it against his head, bang, and blew his brains all over the pillow, and the children heard the shot. They come running in. She started shooting at them, and I don't know if she killed any of the children or not, but when the rescue unit got there, she's standing there like a zombie, clicking a dry 38, and they put her straight in the psych ward, and to this day she claims she don't even know what she did. Do you know what happened in that home that night? A man crossed the line. He crossed the line. I could stand here for the next 30 minutes and tell you stories that blow your socks off. I had a former assistant pastor call me. He said, I got another illustration for your wolf sermon. I said, lay it on me. He said, I had a brother in my church. He passed another state. Now, stay with me. I'm about done. It's the longest sermon I preach. But you'll go to a silly ball game. The thing will go into a double overtime. You'll stay till 10 o'clock, scream your tonsils out, and be glad you were there. And wait in line like a fair let out to get home. You can sit there and listen to the Word of God. Amen. See, I don't like your preaching. I don't like your looks. We're even. So you just sit there. I'm going to, brother, but thanks for the support anyway. <clears throat> he said he had a terrible wreck last week. He said, I rushed down there. He was in intensive care. He was in a coma, guy in his church in another state. He said, when I walked in, he was laying there like this in a semi-coma. And he was saying, <sighs> Brother Brown. Brother Brown. He said, I walked up and said, now he was my former assistant pastor, but he visited one of his members in a wreck. He said, I walked up and said, Brother Larry Brown? He said, yeah. Yeah, Brother brother Larry Brown. And then he, said, he got a wild look in his eye, and he said, the wolves. <laughs> the wolves. And come find out, that man was in Clarence Sexton's church a couple of weeks before that, Powell, Tennessee. He runs 3,000 down there. And I had preached in that church, and I preached this wolf sermon. 
and that man was there and he was a wolf and he didn't like what I preached and he had had a car wreck and he was laying there saying brother brown the wolf and then he said this oh, oh brother brown sure knows how to get his point across no, Brother Brown don't know how to get his point across, but the Holy Spirit of God knows how to get his point across. And let me tell you something. You better keep your mouth off of that man. If you don't like this church, you don't like how he preaches, you don't like what he does around here, if there's a congregation here that does, you better mount your horse. And you better tip your hat. You better ride off in the sunset, and you better not criticize that man. You're going to be earning yourself an early grave somewhere or some disease you can't get over. You, better be, you might be battling with cancer after that one, friend. I'm just saying, wolves live dangerous life. Let me give you this now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach. You say, how long are you going to preach? Till they get done. When they get done, I'll quit. The best defense, <clears throat> you say, Pastor Brother Brown up yonder where they raise those sheep in wolf country. What do they do to keep those sheep from getting the little lamb? Uh, what do they do to keep those wolves from getting the little lambs? Boy, they love those little lambs, little tender lamb chops. And they'll sneak in in lambing time and, and, and sheep time and get those little sheep. What, what, are they, what is the best defense against wolves that those sheep herders have? Uh, and they call something out. I don't care what you call that, neither. What, what do you think they use? Tell me. A what? A mule? No. I, that might work. You may know something I don't know. But you know what they use more than anything in the world? Somebody tell me. What do you think? What do they use? A what? A dog. A dog. A good wolf dog. And we ain't talking about a chihuahua either. No, Hazel. We're talking about an old boy. His mama was a 100-pound pit bulldog, and he never met his daddy, but they say he was from a bad neighborhood. We're talking about a dog. We're talking about a dog at limps because he was in a fight. He's got his, his lip tore out right here. He's got tushes stuck up like that. And, I mean, he's limping because he's been in so many fights with wolves, guarding the sheep against the wolves. And every time he takes a step, he goes... I'm talking about a dog. Every pastor needs a good wolf dog. Yeah. Dick Seaton pastor in California. Built a church to 1,500. Said, I want this old boy to God. He was six foot four, weighed about 240 pounds. Said, he was a hunk of a man. Dumb as a box of rocks, but saved as anybody ever got saved. Happy in the Lord. He said, preacher, what do we do? He said, you got a tithe. He said, what's that? He told him. He said, now what do we do? He said, let's go soul winning. He said, soul whating? He said, soul winning? He said, what's that? He said, come on, I'll show you. They went out. I don't know whether they want anybody to God or not, but on the way back to the church, a pastor thought about a former, uh, uh, thought about a member he hadn't seen in three weeks. Faithful man. So he went by to see him, rung a doorbell, and when he opened the door, he said, I looked in his face, and I knew he had problems. He said he had that sour look. And the pastor said, Brother, I, I've been missing you. I wonder if I could talk to you. Come in. He said we walked in, followed him, went back in and sat down there. And said as we sat down, can I sit down on the edge of this preacher? Okay, I, I always try to behave in somebody else's church. Except for the pulpits I stand on, the pews I run, I behave in other people's church. And he sat down and he began to talk to this brother. Conversation didn't go well. And finally he said, Brother, he said... Um, I've been missing you. Is there some problem? And this guy said, well, pastor, yes, there is. And he raised his finger. He said, yes, there is a problem. And I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. And he tore into the pastor. I mean, verbally tore into it. This pastor said, <laughs> Dick Seaton said, Brother Dick said, you know, he said, I forgot about my young convert sitting over here to the I never thought about it. Never thought about it until I felt the floor shake. And he said, I, I felt this big puff of wind go by. And he said, before I could say sick him to a bulldog, he had grabbed that little fellow around the neck, thrown him down on the floor, and was beating his head against the floor. And he was saying, don't you ever, don't you ever talk about my preacher again as long as you live. Don't you ever talk about my preacher again as long as you live. And he won't either. Matter of fact, at last report, he hadn't even had a negative thought about him. Really, he, I, I mean, really. You say, you condone that kind of behavior? No. Of course not. It's not Christian. But you know how people are sometimes, you know. <clears throat> but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got a preacher friend of mine. 
This is a well-known preacher, too. He was preaching in a church, and the pastor said, Brother, you picked a juicy night to be here. He said, why is that? He said, well, I got a little assistant pastor. Report has it. He's going to get up and say negative things about me and cause a ruckus tonight. And this old preacher talked like this. He said, well, brother, we'll just see how the church service goes tonight. They were having a song service. This little assistant was standing here, and this... Uh, standing right here and the evangelist standing right here and the pastor over here nervous as a cat in a room full of rocking chairs and uh, and 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 this evangelist standing here and during one of the songs they were standing up singing and this evangelist went over and went mm, like that and this young man went mm. he said young man do you feel that he said yeah what is that he said that's a 45 and you say one word about that preacher i'll blow your gut slam out the front of your stomach boy you hear what i'm telling you he said yes sir that was the sweetest, quietest service you was ever in. I don't, look, now don't you go pulling guns on people. And don't you go beating people's heads against the floor. If you do, you're going to get your picture in the paper and my name will be in the article. So don't do that. And you're not going to help this church if you do that. Is everybody with me? Everybody understand what I'm saying? But I'm going to tell you, if you ain't got enough guts to get your big mouth open and stand up against that man, you don't deserve this church and you don't deserve that man to be your pastor. Amen and amen. Pretty good preaching, Brother Brown, if you are doing it. Amen. amen. Let the pastor be the pastor. And the best defense against wolves is a good wolf dog. I know what the wolves say. Uh, pastor, here's what you're going to hear. Pastor, <laughs> we've been here for years. But we're just not being fed. There it is. We're just not being fed. Isn't it funny? People stay in a church and raise their families in a church. Same preacher, same Bible. And if anything, the pastor's better. He knows more Bible, preaching deeper and better messages. But suddenly they're not fed. Here's what's going to shock you. They're telling the truth. Now stay with me. They're telling the truth. They are not being fed. But the reason they're not being fed is not because the stuff's not being put out there. The reason they're not being fed is because they have allowed somebody to de-evaluate the pastor in their eyes, and you can never get out of a pastor any more than the level to which you esteem him. The Bible says, I beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor over you and are over you in the Lord, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. For their work's sake. Not so you can make a god out of them or unduly exalt man, but for their work's sake. You ought to have Pastor Appreciation Day every year. You ought to pa have Pastor's Wife Appreciation Day every year. These people go out here in companies and sell insurance that don't pay off for nothing that happens. And then uh, they give them gold watches and bonuses and everything else. And a man stay for years and serve and love and pray and give. God have mercy. I'm just simply saying, I, I mean, stand with the man of God. Stand with the man of God. I'm just not being fed. I'm just not being fed. Now, let me give you this, and I'm done. Last point. I know this one you've been waiting for. The best way to survive a wolf attack. Did you know some of you won't be in church five years from now? You won't even be in church five years from now. Some, somebody in this room. Because you, you, you're going to have a wolf attack and you're in no condition. There's people in this room, the shadow of the person you once were serving God. You know why? Because you got so hurt or troubled that you can't. I've talked to pastors while I said, Pastor, you're so right. I gave my soul and heart and body to those people and and loved them and won them to God. My husband and I did. And they turned on me. And, she, and I've had women say, I'm not bitter. I'm not mad. I'm not angry. But it just took something out of me. It just won't come back. It just won't come back. Now, friend, listen to me. Um, where they raise buffalo, I didn't know this until I studied this sermon on wood. Where they raise buffalo, you know what they do? They'll take those buffalo and they keep a, a, a cage full of semi-domesticated wolves They'll pull a pin on them, let them run out among their buffalo, and the buffalo will scatter, and there'll be one or two buffalo left, and those wolves will be trotting round and round those um, buffalo. And you know what they do then? Pull the wolves in, put them back in the cage, pull those buffalo in, start giving them antibody because they know they're sick. That's their way to find out which buffalo is sick. The wolves know. They don't know how they know. 
Maybe it's the breathing rate. Maybe it's some particular odor they give off when they're sick. We don't know. But wolves know who's weak. The wolves pray. That's what kills you. They get your weak people. They get your simple people. They get your young converts. They get your younger Christians. That's what kills you. And you know, those old mountain sheep, they can't outrun wolves. They don't have claws to claw them or teeth to bite them. And they can't outrun them. But they've got one defense. When they sense wolves are in the area by smell, they start that trek around the mountain. And every time they come around, they're high. And every time they make another circle, they're high. And they keep going higher. Now, those wolves can go high, too. But the higher those mountain sheep go, the higher the wolves go, tracking them. And the higher the wolves go, the thinner that air gets. And the thinner that air gets, the better those mountain sheep like them. But the thinner the air gets, the worse those wolves like it. And finally, the higher they get. <laughs> finally, if you could understand wolf language, you'd hear one say, hey, look, I'm losing my appetite for lamb chops, aren't you? They say, yeah, let's go down and eat some bullfrogs. This ain't worth it. Let's, let's give it. Huh. Do you know your only defense against wolves? You can't outrun them. You can't compete with them. They're going to come in your church. They're going to come in your church. They're going to rise up from your congregation. May already have. I didn't ask him. I didn't want him to tell me. May not either. Yet. But they will. They will! If you stay here long enough, if this church is here long, if this church does enough to merit a satanic attack, you're going to have wolves in your church. Now watch it. The only way you're going to survive is just keep going higher. Higher and higher in prayer, the Word of God, and in dedication, in obedience, and in surrender to Christ. Just go higher. Pressing on my upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as an onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I believe I hear a wolf howling now. I think we've treed the wolves tonight. And whatever you do, don't forget the night we blew the whistle on the wolf. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody looking around. Now, friend, I'm going to tell you something. If you forget what you've heard preached tonight, you're going to pay for it. As church members, you're going to pay for it if you forget it. And I want to tell you something. The wolves the Apostle Paul said, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. If Paul said, I know this, in a church he had established and people he had won and a church whose doctrine he had established, you think wolves would exempt this congregation? Hey, come on, use your head. Woodpecker does. Use your head. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask this question. How many folks are in this room right now? And you'd say, Pastor Brown, <clears throat> I will admit I have listened to things. That don't mean you had any intent of doing wrong. But you say, I have listened to things I should have never listened to. I've listened to criticism. I meant no harm, didn't know I was doing wrong. But I realize now I should have shut some people up or walked off one or the other. I should have made it known that I don't appreciate people saying negative and derogatory things. I'm not talking about out there in the world, some old drunk. I don't like that church. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people in the church or people that criticize your pastor, so-called Christian people. You say, Pastor Brown, I want you to know tonight I have listened to things I shouldn't have, but by the grace of God, I'm going to get that right tonight, and I'm setting a new course, and I will not allow anybody to run my preacher down or my church down from this night forward, and I want you to pray for me. That's my case. Get your hand up. Hold him up.